Good morning. As everyone continues to make their way in and find their seats, uh, let's uh, greet everyone in the house of the Lord. We're glad to see each one of you. And uh, again, pay attention to the announcements as they scroll across the, the screen and uh, make note of those things. And if you do have an announcement you want to, to speak towards, uh, feel free to make your way to the front and we will give you that opportunity. Um, as I am here, I'm going to go ahead and touch base on a couple of things. Um, one is the um, we're starting a, a new incentive for our, our men, a, a new movement for our men called uh, Men in Prime Time, uh, trying to get creative with men's time and serving the Lord. And uh, they're sponsoring an event coming up uh, on April the 8th. Uh, the NCAA Men's National Basketball Championship game will be played that night. And uh, we're going to have some family fun games and some food and some activities. And we're going to be showing the game in the Family Life Center. So you can come and, and stay as long as you want to. And I know that kids, it's a school night, and kids are going to have to, to, go to, to go home and get in bed and all that good stuff. But uh, we'll turn out the lights when everybody leaves and uh, come and enjoy and and be a part of that time of fellowship on uh, Monday night, April the 8th. We hope that you'll take advantage of that. And also next Sunday, uh, the Taylors from Lillington, North Carolina, will be with us and share with us on a fifth Sunday singing. And we hope that you will invite a friend and bring them with you as we uh, celebrate this together. It's a wonderful trio, and uh, we're looking forward to introducing them to you. Uh, we've been knowing them for uh, several years now, and... And uh, they, they love the Lord uh, with all their heart, and uh, it, it'll show in the, in the way they sing and in the program. So do come and, and be with that. We will be receiving a love offering for them as well. And uh, so bring a friend, a family member that uh, normally doesn't come to church. This will be a good opportunity for them to enjoy some good gospel music. So do come next Sunday uh, in this time of worship. And for the adult class that meets in here, uh, they will be setting up. Uh, during the Sunday school hour, so keep that in mind if you will, okay? Um, the golf tournament is coming up uh, real, real soon. Uh, so we need some help uh, in, in getting this across the finish line, if you will, and to make this a successful event. Uh, we need some sponsors uh, to sell those types of things and do those things. Uh, we need sponsors, and we need some teams. Uh, we need y'all guys to, to get involved. And I think Susan has some samples of the signs that were some of the sponsorship. The, um, that one, the smaller one, uh, will go beside the practice greens. Uh, we also have a put off on that day, and that sign will be there the whole day, whatever the, uh, uh, that's a $50 sign. And it was, so like I said, it, there you go. It, uh, yeah, I do have my Vanna White here. Um, I always wanted to say. <laughs> So uh, that, that's a sponsorship that you can say it's 50 bucks, and like I said, it'd be by the green. Everybody that comes onto the course will see that sign uh, on, the, on the green. It's right there. The larger one is the $100 sponsorship, and it will go on a hole at the tee box. Uh, as the golfers come up to tee off, uh, that sign will be there. And you can sell as many as those if you want to. And let me tell you, those that are the hole, they get all the concentration. Because those people out there, now let me, I did learn something. Did. The green is where the grass grows and it's green. <laughs> but the hole, man, that's where the focus is at. So you tell your friends and your family, anybody that you know that owns a business, the hole is where it's at. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, and, and, and they do pay attention to these signs when they go up to the tee box. Uh, uh, for me, it's to get my mind off what I got to do. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, enjoy. This is April the 13th. Uh, it's 11 o'clock start. We have information in the foyer. And if there's not none, back, if you'll let me know, uh, we can make copies. And uh, so we can sell it. The more sponsorships we sell, um, the, the more profit that we'll make for our uh, building projects and the things that are going on. So keep that in mind and be much in prayer for that. And, and if you like, like I said, any more questions about that, see myself or Randy Williams, and he'll be glad to point us in the right direction, okay? All right. Um, okay. I think I'm done. Uh, Ms. Carroll asked me to make this announcement for the Ladies' Day, Women's Day that is coming up on March the 30th. Um, if you would like to 
uh, purchase a ticket. It would be much better if you would do this ahead of time and uh, register so that they can kind of get a count. Those are $8 each, and uh, Ms. Carol has those today. So if you would see her, um, and invite your friends, ladies, um, to, to come out. They will be tickets available at the door that day, so you can come in through the door. But if you would like to purchase those ahead of time, she has those today. Also, if you need child care uh, for any children ages four and under, um, it will be available that day if you will also see her about that so that uh, so those arrangements can be made. So come out and join us uh, March the 30th for that. Good morning. I know y'all will be glad when this is over so I don't have to get up here every Sunday. Um, this is about the 5K. It is May the 4th from 8 to 10 o'clock in Middlesex at the Children's Home. Um, I have, sorry, we had bow berries this morning. Um, I have already had over five people sign up, so the price will be $15 um, a person. I do have some people that are willing to sponsor runners or walkers, so if you are in need of a sponsor, please let me know. That will be kept between us. Um, this was just on my heart sitting there. Please lead by example. Um, you know, we say we want activities in our church and, uh, you know, we want kids to be involved in things. But if they don't see adults reaching out and, you know, looking in the bulletin, the, the supply drive for the children's home, if they don't see us doing these things, you know, the words that, we, that we're saying to them to, to be involved or to donate or to volunteer their time is pointless unless we're leading by example on that. So, also, um, I've got a friend that is interested in running this, and to my knowledge, she and her husband and daughter aren't going to church anywhere. And now this has nothing to do with being in a dress on Sunday morning, being in a church service, but it's a way that I can reach out. We can maybe run together, and you know, she can meet some people here at church, and that's potentially a way to open the door. So if you know somebody that likes to run or likes to walk, or if you just want to invite them and you know they don't go to church, this could be a nice informal way to to open that door and to bridge that gap there. Um, please see me if you're interested in going. I believe it's the 14th is the last day that I will be able to take registration forms because I'm going to have to mail those in. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Tiff. Um, anyone else? I did uh, pay attention, if you will, make note of the uh, insert. It's in your bulletin. Uh, the Children's Home Supply Needs Project uh, collection dates uh, through the month of April. Uh, it's sponsored by our uh, Bethlehem Women's Ministry team, so keep this in mind. It uh, gives you the list of the things that uh, are needed, uh, personal hygiene, cleaning supplies, and those type of things. So, uh, again, make note of that, and please uh, support this endeavor uh, on behalf of the Children's Home. Okay. Any other announcement that needs to be made? If not... We're going to, to go into our time of worship, and, and, and that's, that's why we're here, is to worship our Lord. And today we're uh, concluding our series of messages on intersections, uh, bringing God in our ordinary. Uh, today as we conclude this uh, session, we're going to be looking at the question, we're sitting at an intersection, now what? What are we going to do? And, and, and as we look at that um, it kind of the other day we were riding in Wilmington, and most of you know that that um, I was born and raised in Wilmington, and, and and but things have changed over the last few years uh, in Wilmington. Um, in the process of that, roads have been widened, roads have been extended, uh, all of these things have taken place, and the landscape and the the look of Wilmington has changed in some areas, and and I found myself uh, briefly pulling up to an intersection and looking around and, and none of the landmarks that I was used to being there. You know, uh, I'm guilty. I'm, I'm bad about traveling and looking for road marks, you know. And if they ever cut down the oak tree, I'd be lost, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, 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 and they had moved some of these traditional landmarks that, that I knew was supposed to be on the corner of these streets. So it, I had to stop and think for just a moment and, and, and position myself to make sure I'm where I'm supposed to be. 
And sometimes when we come up in life, we have intersections that, that come up in our life that we sit there and we think, where am I supposed to be? And you might be at that intersection today. You might be at a time in your life you're asking, what now? So we're going to examine that today and give you some ideas as to what you might want to do next. And uh, that's the part of the intersections that we've been talking about for the last three Sundays. And, and we hope that it's been a blessing to you as uh, it has been to me as we wrap this up um, today. Uh, intersections, uh, bringing God into our ordinary. Um, great things can happen when, when, when we allow that to take place. And in so doing, uh, are you ready to sing? I'm glad we've got one over here ready to sing. The rest of you catch up, page 136 in your hymn book. Are you washed in the blood? I want you to consider that question as you sing the song. Let's stand and sing it together. Just the ladies on this verse. Okay, men, let's sing this next verse. Just the men. When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? And are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Okay, church. Are you washed in the blood and the soul cleansing blood? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? Are they white as the Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. Okay, you got you be seated in the house of the Lord. As we come together, we want to continue our time of worship, and there's no greater time to worship than in prayer. Corporately come together to to lift the needs of God's people before the throne of grace and, and knowing that God hears and answers our prayers. It's such a wonderful blessing to be able to come together to do exactly that. And we're going to start on this side if you have a request and continue to remember those uh, 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 that's on our prayer list, that's in your bulletin. Continue to lift them up before the Lord. Ted? Okay. Yes, Sarah. Way back there, back. Okay. 
Levi, you, well, thank you. Appreciate that, Levi. Go ahead. Eddie and Amy's child end up had terminal cancer, and I have two young teenage girls that are losing their parents. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, yeah. about on this side. Anybody with requests for prayer? Ms. Rose? Okay. Yeah, remember Lisa. How's she doing? Good? Lisa doing okay? Any others? If not, uh, as we go through this time of prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Michael, would you mind coming and lead us in this time of prayer if you can? Uh, there you go. Uh, as we share this time of prayer, um, God's good. We've got so much to be thankful for. And uh, we're glad that we have a God that hears and answers our prayers. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace today humbly but boldly knowing that you hear our prayers today, Lord. Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for watching out over us. We just thank you for doing the things that you do, even the things that we don't realize you're doing, Lord. We just want to give you praise and glory for today. Lord, you've heard all the names and of the ones that are suffering this morning or going through hard times, Lord. And we just want to lift each and every one up to you. And we ask, Lord, that you touch each one in a special way, Lord. Lord, we pray that whatever they're going through and whatever plan you have for them, that your name be glorified above all else. Lord, we just want to pray, pray for our country and, and all the division that's in it right now, Lord. We just pray for revival to break out and and for, for people to turn back to you, Lord. And the only way they can do that is by repenting and turning to Jesus Christ and trusting in him as the only way of salvation, Lord. Lord, we just pray for this church and we pray for the things that you're doing in this church, Lord. We just pray that this church becomes a light to the community and for the county and for the state and for the country, for the whole world, Lord. Let it be used for your glory, and Lord, as a, as a tool that you use to win souls in the kingdom of heaven, Lord. Lord, we just, we just want to ask, we just be, ask that you be with our speaker today, our pastor, um, and just give him the words that your people need to hear today, Lord. Lord, prepare our minds and hearts to receive it, and we'll give you all the praise and glory, Lord. And all these things we ask in the name that's above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, I want to uh, ask God to remember the Tar Heels in the tournament this year. <laughs> Are you that worried about it? No, you need to come to the altar in a little bit. <laughs> hey, uh, Lord, forgive us. You know, we, just, we, just, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, at this time, we're going go to go to our time of offering. Uh, look, folks, don't, don't take for granted the opportunity we have to worship through giving. Uh, we get nervous. We don't like to talk about money in church for some reason, but um, it's your time to worship. It's your time to participate as God moves in the midst of his people as we honor him 
and returning back that which he has given to us. So let's worship as we give. I want to ask the ushers if you would come and lead us in this time of worship. Let us pray. My son, Father, we're thankful for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come to your house and worship today. Lord, it's a beautiful day, Lord, today as we come together and Lord, we know that you're still in control of all things. I ask you to bless this offering, might you take and may be used for that death in your kingdom. In name we pray. Amen. Uh, this time I know y'all uh, anxiously await this moment <clears throat> so we're going to let you wait just a minute <laughs> you can turn around and greet your neighbors and welcome them in the house of the Lord please and choir would you come and children's church be dismissed follow
Children's Church, y'all can be uh, dismissed. And One thing I have learned over again as being a grandfather is they move at their own speed. Sometimes it's wide open, and sometimes a snail can beat them. You know, it just uh. <laughs> try your Bibles. Turn with us, if you will, to to Luke chapter nine. As uh, this has been kind of a the the um, the base verse, if you will, the text that we have base this series of intersections, bringing God into our ordinary. Um, When our obedience and our faith line up with what God is doing, God's going to do some good stuff. He shows up, and and, uh, we're just so thankful that he has chosen people like you and me. We don't deserve it, but God has chosen folks just like you and me. He's called us to be his representative, to be his ambassadors, and we have that opportunity and so we look today as again as we conclude this series we're looking at intersections and when you come up to your intersection what now all of us at one time or another in our life we can call them intersections we can call them whatever we want to we've come up to a point in our life that we've got to make a decision when you when you come up to that stop sign or that traffic light has you stopped you you you've got to make a decision You're either going to turn right or you're going to turn left. You're going to go straight. Why even approaching the intersection, you've got to make a decision to whether or not you're going to be obedient to the the intersection. Are you going to stop? There's a stop sign there. But you make the decision as to whether or not you're going to stop. That traffic light turns yellow and we speed up. No, we're supposed to slow down, right? But we... (laughs) See, it's first to the intersection. But but are we going to be obedient? When we come up to the intersection. So there's a lot of questions that takes place when we come up to moments in our lives when we don't understand. We may not know exactly what's taking place. But these intersections, these times that we have to stop and to listen to the voice of God. And and so many times we've talked with people and counseled with people. and, And they say, well, I just don't know what. And God has been pretty clear about what he wants you to do in your life. You're just not listening. You're just not being obedient to the call that God is leading you and guiding you towards. And and you're allowing your fear and the lack of faith to step forward. But as we look at Luke chapter 9 and 23, in verse 23, it says, And and Jesus had just um, been through several events. Uh, He's healed the woman with the issue of blood. He sent the twelve out to preach. He raised Jairus' daughter. And all of these things, he fed 5,000. And then he comes... To verse 23, and he said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is it of man advantaged, or better off, if he gain the whole world and lose himself? Or be cast away. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when the, he shall come in his own glory, and his fathers, and in the holy angels. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Today we want to look at three things when it comes to an intersection, and then we're going to, to look at these three things, and, and just so happen they all begin with the letter S, so maybe you can remember it. These three things, basically in order, when you begin to look at some of these things, the way they play out in our life, we're going to look at these three things, and then we're going to close with a a challenge for each of us. So if I don't give you the challenge, before we have our prayer benediction, somebody raise their hand and say, wait a minute, we want that challenge, okay? I know you're going to want this challenge. (laughs) The first thing we want to talk about is, is salvation. 
as we come up to the intersections in life, all of us, uh, if you're here today and you know Christ is your personal Savior, there was a moment in time in your life that you came up to the intersection to make the choice to either receive Christ or reject Christ. Some of you may be coming up on that intersection now. Some of you may have been sitting at this intersection for a very long time, and there's people honking their horns getting you to go on. Some of you have been sitting at that intersection so long that mama and daddy and grandma and granddaddy and aunts and uncles and preachers and deacons have been praying for you and for the salvation of your soul for so long, they don't know, they, they, they don't know if you're going to make that decision or not. You're at that intersection. There's folks all around this church, all in this community that are at that intersection. They may not realize it. They may be like going down to Wilmington and coming up to an intersection that you know used to be, but doesn't look familiar to you. They may not know what's going on. They may not know why they're sitting at this intersection. But salvation is so important. It's, it's that first step for us to understand what God's doing in our life and what He wants to do for us. And, and in fact, John chapter 3, and, and we automatically go to, to verse 16, but, but, but to understand the, the previous verses to that, we have a gentleman, Nicodemus, came to, to Jesus and said, Wait, what, what, what is it? And he come at night. <laughs> and, and he came and said, Well, what is all, well, what, how can, how can, how can you be born again? And he began to talk to Jesus about the, the, the process about being saved. And, and Jesus began to tell him about how you, it's not a physical rebirth. It's a spiritual rebirth. It's an understanding that, that there is a Savior and that you're in need of rescuing. You're out there in the middle of the ocean and you can't swim. And the life preserver has been thrown out there to you. You've got to reach out and grab it. And Jesus began the process of explaining that. And, and finally, he comes to that verse 16. He says that my father loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, oh, I'm glad he said whosoever. <laughs> he didn't say some. He didn't say a few. He didn't say a select few. He said whosoever, that includes you and me. Whosoever shall believe in him shall have life and have it everlasting. And then he begins to tell him, say, look, I've not come to condemn the world. They've done that on their own. <laughs> they, 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 now, that's a Timmy paraphrase. But, but Jesus said, I've not come to condemn the world. But I've come that through me the world might be saved. Jesus says that I've, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. I've come in order that those that are struggling with the fight against Satan might have a warrior that is in their corner to win the battle. Jesus says that I've come in order that when I die on the cross and I'm buried and I rise again, that I can promise everyone that believes in me a resurrection. You see, we can believe in a resurrection. We can be assured of the resurrection because Jesus was dead one time. He was in a dark tomb one time. But the Bible claims to us and tells us and, and the evidence points to the fact that on Sunday morning he arose. He, he's not in that grave no more. He arose and victorious. He arose over death and he has ascended into the Father. And I'm so thankful, as we talked about two Sundays ago, that when Peter was told, Jesus said, Look, Satan has a desire to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. <laughs> I'm glad to know that Jesus is praying for me. I'm glad to know that Jesus is in my corner pulling for me. Even when I'm beaten and bruised, when I'm torn down and broken, Jesus is still pulling for me. He still loves me. He still wants to bring me back he still wants to make me anew if I just turn to him and receive his counsel it's like that old boxer he got beat up big in the first round but he went over there in his corner and he sat down on his stool and that old trainer came along and his coach and they massaged him and they they patted his cheeks and they they done that medicine thing and they got the, got all that bleeding under control and they and, and the old coach told him okay champ go out there and get him That's Jesus in our corner. When we're beaten and bruised and, and we come to him for counsel and we nuzzle up to him, maybe at an old-fashioned altar. We, we've lost sight of an old-fashioned altar. We don't know what the old-fashioned altar any, is anymore. I don't care how... <laughs> can, can, I, can I get all the... Just, just, I'm not going to charge you extra this. I seen a sign the other day that says, New Modern Contemporary Worship. If it's contemporary... 
Isn't it new? And if it's new, isn't it modern? I'm, I'm just, but he, we've lost sight. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to charge you enough for that one. But, 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 we've lost sight of what an old-fashioned honor is. We've lost sight of the fact that God calls us to his house to dwell with him. He calls us to be in his presence. He calls us to experience his salvation. We, he calls us in order that we might dwell and come into his presence. And sometimes we do good with the singing. We do good with the fellowship, but we lose sight of getting with him. To come to this altar and to nuzzle up, to get in the corner so that he can massage us, so he can medicate us, so he can pump us up and tell us, go out there and get them, boy. You got this round. Salvation assures us that Jesus is on our side. It, he, it tells us that in, in, through the shedding of his blood, the, the congregation that we just sang uh, just a few moments ago, are you washing the blood? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. When you're sitting at an intersection such as this, you've got to ask yourself, am I washed in the blood? Has his soul-cleansing blood been poured upon my life? So that when God the Father looks down upon us, he doesn't see our wretchedness. He doesn't see our sinfulness. He doesn't see our unworthy condition. He sees the blood of his son. <laughs> and he sees the fact that his son died for our sins. And because he sees his son, he sees our holiness through Jesus Christ. That's salvation. We can't, do th we can't shine ourselves up enough. To be worthy to be in God's presence. That's why when we come to church. Can I go back old school for a few moments? That's why we come. This is, Y'all, th this is his house. Can I ask you a question? If you're going to go visit somebody, it's their house. Are you going to respect it? More than likely, you're going to go and they're going to invite you in and you know, you come and make yourself at home and sit down. But you know, you're probably not going to sit down and, and throw your foot up on their favorite coffee table, are you? Mm -hmm. No. And more than likely, you know, they, they, you're a good host. You know, they, they, they come on in, make yourself at home. And, and I, I promise you, as a guest, I don't go pillaring through people's refrigerators. You, 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 that's respect. So why do we come in God's house and not pay him respect? Why do we come in God's house and run all over the place and mistreat the house of God? Why? Why do we not show respect in God's house? Just a question. Why do we come to God's house? You know, now this, Lord, why are you doing it? That, that was not... This is just a conversation between me and God. Just hang on. And, and I'm going to step down here because I, I don't want this to offend anybody. It's, it's, not a, it, it's, just, it's just a question. Because I want... It, it, you wear the best you can to the house of God. Period. Okay? But you know what? We get to respect God the way we present Him ourselves. And if we were to come into the presence of the President of the United States, if you knew next Sunday he was going to be here, how would you dress? Just, I got a feeling most of you would probably spruce yourself up just a little bit. Maybe even shower next Sunday morning. <laughs> We've come to God's house. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Majesty. We need to spruce ourselves up a little bit. Not because we have to, because we get to. It's an honor to present ourselves, the Bible says, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. It's an honor to clean ourselves up. And present ourselves to God a little bit differently than we do the world. Okay, that's just, that's just for extra. And if you don't, it, just, it is what it is. Salvation is what God intends for our heart. For each man and woman, boy and girl. He does not desire for anyone to die and go to hell. Not a soul. He doesn't want anyone to experience the torment of hell. That's not why he created hell for 
And that's why he sent his son. Well, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, that there's two ways. There is an intersection, there is a crossroads, and, and you've got a choice. The Bible says that there is a narrow way, and there is a wide or broad way. There, there is a narrow way that, that leads to righteousness. There's a narrow way that is hard. It's a narrow way that it, it, it does get kind of rigid. It, it, it's a narrow way, but, but God said it, 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 leads to, it leads to heaven. And then there's a broad way, there's a wide way that you can choose that leads to destruction. So you choose. It's your intersection. It is your moment in time that you can choose which way to go. Yeah, the broad way, it looks easy. Oh, there looks like there's a lot of fun. There's, there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of uh, celebration going on. And, and all of that stuff going on over there. And, and it's easy to get there. Oh, but there's this narrow way. That through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can enter to this way, this, this, this path that leads us to righteousness. It's your choice. It's your intersection. Second thing we talked about, salvation, we, we must consider surrender. That word surrender, that one action, I think keeps a lot of God's people away from enjoying the blessings that God has in store for his people. I think it's going to be a moment in time when we get to heaven that we're going to realize that there are so many blessings that God had for us, but because we were unwilling to surrender to God, we missed out. God was not able to release the blessings and the things that he has intended for us simply because we were unwilling to surrender. We were unwilling, as verse 23 in our text says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We weren't willing to make the sacrifice to say, Lord, I'm yours, and, and I'm going to surrender my thoughts, my actions, all that I am, all that I have, I'm going to surrender to you. I am convinced that through salvation in Jesus Christ, I am convinced that that is the life that I need to live. And Father, I'm going to surrender my all to you. Paul was preaching over in the book of Acts in, in, in chapter 26. And, and actually, he was, he was actually defending himself, but he took the opportunity to do a little bit of preaching. That's what preachers do. He was preaching, and in the midst of this, as he was talking to the governor, and, and King Agrippa was sitting there, and he had laid out the salvation plan. He had laid out what Christ had done. He had shown all of the works that Jesus had done, and even in his own life, he testified what Jesus has done for him that's all he requires, is for us to testify of what he has done for us. And as he was doing so, it came down to the very last, the, the question was asked, King Agrippa, do you believe? <laughs> and, and, and Agrippa said, almost. Oh, that word almost. <laughs> almost. Almost. You persuaded me to be a Christian. Almost. How many of you are sitting here today almost persuaded? Almost persuaded. Oh, you may have made the action. You have come and you've prayed that God forgive me of my sins. You've been baptized. Your name is on the church roll. But you still not made a decision to surrender. You still want to hold on to the world. You, you want to participate in the world stuff. You want to do what the world has to offer. You want the, you want the fun that the world has to give. But you've still not surrendered your all to Jesus. So look over, if you will. Uh, you don't have to turn over there if you don't want to, but in, in Romans chapter 10, if you've got your little iPhone, your phone there, you can turn over, you, know, you can look it up real quick. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and this is one of these passages that, that, that's on the Romans road, and, and a lot of folks use this as a passage to witness and to, 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 to talk to a lost soul, and, and okay, it can be, but, but I, don't, I need you to understand that this is a passage that is being written to the Christians. Not the lost. This is a passage intended for the born again. Listen, when he says here in verse 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now it goes on a little bit further in verse 10. It says, for with the heart 
Man believeth unto righteousness, and it's with the mouth confession is made into salvation. It is that mouth, that public profession of faith. It is that walk, it is that witness day to day that shouts out from the mountaintops that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. It is that moment of surrender that we're willing to, out of the very depths of our soul, live for Jesus Christ. That will speak out of our heart those things which God would have us to speak out of. That we have surrendered our tongue. We have surrendered our thoughts. We have surrendered our mind. We have surrendered our heart. We've surrendered our pocketbooks. We have surrendered our shoes. We've surrendered our clothes. We've surrendered everything that we have in order to honor God and to bless God and to testify what God has done for us. It is that moment that we make the decision that we're going to surrender, that we just go from being an adolescent to a grown up you know what it is to be an adolescent Christian just hang around an adolescent boy or girl they've grown just enough to know a little bit but they're in that part of life that they're changing how many how many have raised an adolescent or how many of you have raised one <laughs> again I go back to an authority Years ago, and, and I believe it's good, uh, it's good theology too, <laughs> that when a, <laughs> when a boy or girl turns 13, the best thing you do is lock them in a closet, feed them through a hole in the door <laughs> until they get 18, and then you can let them out. And, and, and that comes from James Dobson, you know. <laughs> but, but in the process of this, being an adolescent, and that's where we are when we made the profession of faith, we've accepted Christ, but we've not surrendered. We're an adolescent Christian. Nobody knows what to do with you. The pastor can't please you. The deacons can't please you. The Sunday school teacher don't teach the lesson right. The singing ain't right. The choir don't sing right. The right kind of music's not being sung. The right kind of fellowship's not being had. As an adolescent Christian, you do more harm to a church than good. I'm just laying it out there for you. And it's that moment in time that we're willing to surrender and say to ourselves and say to God, God, you're more important than anything else I, go, I got going on. And I will pick up my cross and I will follow you every day and grow up. You know, sometimes we want to look at some Christians and just kind of shake them a little bit and say, grow up. <laughs> I'm not calling their names. <laughs> just... Nobody here in district. But it, grow up. That's surrender. That's when we come to a point we know that it's not almost, but we are totally persuaded that Jesus is who Jesus said he was and he could do what he says he could do. And God is still God. And I'm longing for the day that I'll be in his presence and I'm going to surrender my all to him. Oh, we may be saved. But you might be sitting at that intersection of surrender and you've not yet made the decision which way you're going to go are you going to continue to serve self are you going to continue to serve others or are we going to make the decision to serve God pick up your cross daily and follow me he came to his disciples he told his disciples upon talking to them and, and dealing with them he said look Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. That's surrender. That's surrender. You got to give it all out. You got to commit to it. Years ago, going fishing with my father-in-law, it's not a one-hour deal. <clears throat> it's the whole thing. You, you, if you throw out your nets, and catch one fish, you're going to throw your net out ten more times over the next three and a half hours trying to catch fish. If you throw your net out the first time and catch a cooler full, you're going to throw your net out ten more times over the next three and a half hours. It doesn't matter. It's surrender. We're going out there. We're going to catch some fish. And if we catch fish, we're going to keep catching fish until we stop catching fish, until we wore out we can't pull that net in anymore. Then we'll come in. Then you got to clean them so you can eat them. Yeah. That's surrender. We need to make the decision today to surrender and give it our all. Sell out for Jesus Christ. 
That last verse says in verse 26, and, and we're going to get back to this in a moment, but it says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, I'm going to be ashamed of you before my Father. Surrender. The last one we want to spend just a few moments on is stewardship. And no, we're not talking about money. I'm talking about service. I'm stewardship, taking care of what you've been given. Taking care of, intending to, and benefiting that which God has blessed you with. Stewardship. To be fishers of men. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, the writer there in the book of Acts says, Look, the power shall come upon you that you shall be given the authority to be witnesses of me in Judea and Samaria and uttermost parts of the world. So you and I sit here today with a commandment. We don't have to question what our calling is. A lot of folks are sitting around saying, I, I'm waiting for God to, to, to call. I'm, I'm waiting for God to tell me what to do. Wait no more. You're at that intersection. Move on. Because he's already told us that every man, woman, boy, and girl that is born again and has their blood, is the blood of Christ applied to their life, each man, woman, boy, and girl is called to be a witness. To tell somebody about what Jesus has done for me. You don't have to have a theological degree. You don't have to have a doctorate. You don't have to have all these years of education behind you to tell people what Jesus has done for you. You don't have to understand Hebrew or Latin to be able to tell people what Jesus has done for you. You just got to be willing to do it, to not be ashamed. You know how it goes. We, 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 all, we, we don't have no problem telling people the things we like. Do it. No, we don't. I mean, we'll tell people our favorite restaurant in a heartbeat, just like that. Oh, you want to go to a good place to eat? Go here. Oh, you want to go find a deal on some clothes? Go here. Oh, we'll, we'll tell people all the time where they want, you want, to, you want some good ice cream? There's a store down the road that has hand-dipped ice cream. Man, you give them a little bit of money, and they give you a glob of ice cream. We'll, we'll tell people about the things that we enjoy. Why do we have such a hard problem telling people about Jesus? If we're ashamed of him here on this earth, he's going to be ashamed of us before the Father. Because that's where it all ends. We're all going to stand before God in some form or another. Oh, we're going to stand, we're either going to bow before him here and pronounce him as Lord and Savior today, or there's going to be a common time when we'll stand in heaven and bow a knee and pronounce him as Lord. But when we do it then, it's going to be too late. Do it now and reap the benefits. The Bible tells us that we that are born again, we that have had the blood applied to our lives, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be rewarded for the things that we have done for the kingdom. All our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And he'll, he'll look us up and he'll, he'll find us written right there. And, and, and the Bible says there's two books over there. And he's going to come over here to the life that we've lived. And he's going to flip over here and find our name. And he, there's going to be a list of stuff that we've done. <laughs> oh. We'll be rewarded for those things. Crowns filled with jewels for the works that we've done for the kingdom. My old preacher said one time, I hope my crown's so heavy with jewels I have to get a crane to pick it up and put it at the feet of Christ. <laughs> That's the ultimate goal. That's what we're headed for, regardless of what some say today. It's heaven to gain. The Bible says here that we have an opportunity to stand at an intersection and choose to serve God fully. And not be ashamed of him. You know, Jonah, he, he stood at an intersection and he was called to go to, to Nineveh. And, 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 you know, Jonah didn't like Nineveh. He didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he really didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was afraid God was going to send revival and save all those folks. And Jonah didn't really have a heart for these people. And, and so he made a decision that he was going to go another direction. Even when we choose the wrong direction, 
God gives us second chances. <laughs> God turned Jonah around by the use of a great fish. Now, there I know the Bible doesn't say a whale. It was a big fish. And the biggest fish I know out there is probably a whale. I'm going to say it's a whale. And when I get to heaven, God will correct me. I don't know, maybe on a red snapper, I don't know. But a big fish swallowed him up and he changed his direction. There are times that God stops us dead in our tracks in the middle of the road to intersect with our life and say, boy, girl, you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around and go the other way. There's a song that I heard. Don't, don't get took. I'm not going to sing for you. A, a while back, uh, and it's seem like it's, it's, it just lingers in different places. But the gentleman who wrote this song wrote it out of the experience that he had when he came to Christ. I want you to listen to the words. If I can get through it. <clears throat> my sleep is gone. My heart is full of sorrow. I can't believe how much I've let you down, God. I dread the pain that awaits for me tomorrow when the sun reveals my broken dreams scattered on the ground. I can't believe the God of glory and earth would take the time to care for someone like me. <laughs> oh, but I read in the Bible that old story. How he pled for my forgiveness while dying on a tree. Please forgive me. I need your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Help others find their way. I'm at your mercy. Please. Please. Forgive me. At the moment of the intersection that we come to realize we're nothing. We fail God so many times. And in our hearts, we come to that intersection. And all we can do is look up into his wondrous, glorious face and cry out from the very depths of our soul, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Lord, all I have is in you. Help me to make it through. that I might serve you and help someone else along the way. You see, that's the disconnect. We come to know Christ. We may even surrender our all to him and give him everything we got. We serve him in every capacity we possibly could, but we stop short in helping others do the same. We fall short in realizing that there are other people out there that are living their life in sin that needs Jesus as much as we did. And folks, I, I, I'm, naive, I'm one of those old-fashioned dudes. Sin is still sin, and that hasn't changed to please a certain generation. Sin is still sin. 
And when you disobey God, regardless of what that is, you're going against what God has to say. And I'm not judging you. The Bible says that by their fruits you shall know them. And if they're bearing fruit that is of Satan, if they're bearing fruit that is against God in a disobedience to God, they're lost. They need Jesus. And if they don't change, they're going to bust hell wide open. And it's a loving nature of a Christian that will go to a person that sees their fruit, that they're know they're not bearing the fruit of God to say, friend, you need Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you about the love of Christ. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. But we stop short. We don't get that far. You know what we do most of the time? And this goes back to that adolescent Christian. We come over here in our little clique. Did you see? Did you know that so and so, did you see all that he did? Well, that's just a shameful thing. I, I wouldn't be caught dead doing those kinds of things. And we talk about it in our little clique, but what we don't realize when this person steps out of this clique, they'll find them a little clique over here and say, Did you, you know those folks, they're a bunch of gossipers. They, 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 they talk about one another like crazy, and, and it, just, it, it just bothers me. I know you've heard those conversations. Instead of going to that person and telling them about the love of Jesus Christ and that he has forgiveness to give to them if they would only realize to stop and realize they need a Savior and the only one that fits the bill. Muhammad can't do it. Buddha can't do it. Islam can't do it. There's only one that can do it, and that's God through his Son to give us life everlasting that says look if you come to me I will bear your burdens I will forgive you your sins and I will raise you to a new life and set your feet on the path that leads to righteousness I can do those things says God but we stop short of telling people that please Lord forgive me forgive me it says here to take up a cross and follow me. It talks about saving our own souls and, and, and doing our own thing. But it's much more beneficial if we allow ourselves to be saved by the name of Christ. To tell people, not be ashamed. He tells us and directs us in Matthew, in the famous commission, the great commission, to go, to teach, to preach. To win souls for the kingdom. There's a little word play I like to use sometimes. And it requires audience participation. So you're all awake? Okay. What's the first three letters of the word Satan spelled? What? Okay. It's not a trick question, y'all. It's okay. Say it with confidence. What's the first two letters of the word God spell? You get the picture? He wants us to go. He wants us to preach. He wants us to teach. He wants us to reach out to those that are lost. And do you realize that there are people within the shadows of our steeples of our church, within a small radius of Bethlehem Original Free Baptist Church, that needs Jesus? They're lost. They have questions. They're at intersections in their life. And they need someone to come around to give them some answers. So here's the challenge. I know you've been on pins and needles waiting for the challenge. As you go in and go out and wherever you live, how many houses do you think you pass Five? More than five? Ten? Fifteen? Twenty? Some of you probably passed fifty or sixty, probably a hundred. Here's the challenge, and it's this simple. Evangelism scares people. And, and it is, it, evangelism has changed over the years, but here's a real simple way that over the next six weeks, we have an opportunity to reach out to those in our community. It's real simple. What I want you to do is go home today. Don't put it off. 
In fact, if you go out to eat, take a pencil with your pen and use a napkin. They're wonderful note tabs, okay? Use a napkin. I want you to write down. You can, you, you can visualize your neighborhood right now. I'm not talking about family necessarily, okay? Just think about that house that you pass by. You don't know them, but you're going to begin Monday morning. You're going to begin to pray for that home. You may not know who's there. It may be one of those houses that you've seen a for sale sign on for a long time, and finally it's sold, and people have moved into that house. That's a good place to pray. You might see that there's a new play pen that has, or a play set that's been put out in the yard, and, and you think, well, you know, they've got kids. Pray for the family. Pray. You're going to start Monday. You don't have to say a lengthy prayer, but as you pass by that home, maybe you walk in the afternoons, and, and you walk past this house, and, and, and you, you're praying as you're walking by. You just say a simple prayer. We're going to do that for 14 days. We're going to start Monday for 14 days. We're going to pray for those people that you designate. Just, uh, just pray as you pass them by. Pray. In two weeks, we're going to, to give you a card with an envelope and a stamp. We'll make it just as easy for you as possible. You've just got to tell me how many you need. On that following Monday... You're going to fill out the address. At home. You, again, you don't know who lives there, but it's real easy to get an address. And you're going to write on there that address, family of so-and-so address, and put it in the mail. That card I'm going to give to you will simply say, we thought you ought to know that you've been prayed for for the past 14 days. From someone at Bethlehem that cares. You're just going to send them that card. No request. No response required. You're just going to send them the card. The rest of that week, you're going to continue to pray for that family, that home. The next Sunday, we're going to give you another card. We're going to step up the pace just a little bit. You're going to send them another card. This time... You're going to request a little bit of information. You're going to enclose with that card a self-stamp so that it don't cost them nothing, that they can slip a prayer request so you can pray specifically for them. Or maybe they're interested in whatever. We're going to have that card for them to fill out that they can mail back here to the church that we can follow up on that. How much easier can that be? The question is, are you going to be willing to be a steward? Are you going to take advantage of the opportunity as a church? This works, folks. I know apartment complexes that have been changed because people were willing to pray. People were willing to extend a hand. One of the parts of that prayer, I'm going to get back to the message in just a minute, one of the parts of that prayer will be to ask God for an opportunity an open door to minister to that family, that home. <laughs> Let God do what God does. You'd be surprised how God might open that opportunity. I'll share with you a testimony of one gentleman that done this. He said he'd been living in that community. He'd been praying for these folks for these 14 days. He sent them the cards and he really didn't know him from Adam. He didn't know who lived there. But one day he was at a grocery store. He and his wife, and, and, and as they were shopping, there was a couple there that was struggling with some kids, and, and, and his wife just walked over and helped them out a little bit, get their groceries up on the counter to get them paid for, and helped them out. And they got to talking, and who was it? <laughs> it's that family they've been praying for. God opened that door. You never know until you try it. I challenge you to try it. Part two of the challenge will come up in about three weeks.
And uh, so take advantage of this. Just let me know how many cards you need. You're at an intersection. Some of you, some of you are here at the intersection of really changing your life. You've never accepted Christ. You're at that intersection. I beg you today, make your choice wisely before you leave. Maybe you're here today as a Christian and you're standing at our intersection. And, and Susan, you can go to the piano. And so we begin this invitation. It's time for you to respond to what God has given it. You've got a lot of doubts in your life. You, you, you're, you're at one of those multi point intersections. One of the most dangerous intersections there is is one with them five points. You've got five entrances into a single. But that's a dangerous situation. But you're there. You're at a good place. Because you're in the presence of the God that knows. And if you just talk to him, you're at that intersection. Maybe you're at that intersection today that you have been struggling with surrender. You want to. Oh, you want to. But it's just, it's just something that keeps you... You're just holding back. Make the decision today. And you're here today as a Christian and you want to share your faith. You're scared. You really don't know if you can. Oh, you can. All you've got to do is trust the Lord. You're at that intersection. He's already called you. He's already told you. He's already commanded us to be witnesses of Him. And He'll give you the strength to do it. If you'll just make the decision today. Your salvation, being born again, your surrender to all that God's calling you to do. Uh, and then stewardship. Taking care of what God has given you. So that your intersections with people, as God crosses your life with other people, sometimes in a very sad day of their life, sometimes in times when they need the most help, but God is intersecting your life. Will you stand? It's your decision. Will you surrender your all to Him? Will you serve Him? If you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior, will you? Cry out in the midst of your broken dreams, please forgive me. Every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask if you will to take a moment in time and pray. Will you come? The decision is yours. We're going to close in a prayer. And it's my desire that you would long to see the presence of God bolder and stronger in your life than ever before. My prayer is that if you are lost here today, if you are backslidden and you've made a shipwreck of your faith, I pray that you'd step out and come. Oh, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, for, for your people. Oh, these are good people. Love them. And, and Lord, you... you you're working in the midst of their lives in so many different ways. and So glad to be called their pastor. We pray, Father, today that you would, would dwell in their hearts, Lord, today. Whatever the need, whatever the intersection that they're sitting in, the questions, the doubts, the concerns, whatever it might be, we pray that they might find the answers that they're seeking in your presence today. Father, for those that are in our community that does not know Christ as our personal Savior, Lord, we're going to make an asserted effort. Over the next six weeks, we're going to move in a way that, Father, that we can reach out to people, Lord, in a tender, loving way. And, Father, we pray that you bless it. It's not because we're putting together this thing. It's not because for anyone's glory. But, Father, we, we want to see souls saved. We want to see your kingdom grown. 
We pray, Father, that you bless those names that people are going to begin to pray for in the morning. And Lord, we pray that you lay upon the hearts of your people those right places that you're already planting seeds. You've already cultivated the soil. And, and Lord, that they're, they're ready to receive. And we pray, Father, that those words may go out. Lord, that a harvest truly can be reaped. Oh, it's that seed time that we can reap the harvest. We ask you, Father, to move in the midst of your people. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your blessings. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Don't forget Foreign Missions, their telethon is today. Call in and make your contributions to them. If you need the number, I think it's in your bulletin. Be glad to share that. God bless you. You're liberty to go in the fear of God. May God bless you as you go your way.